Sorry. And I'm not sure about how many of you tonight, but um, this is my first time working in a place other than my home office for quite some time. So stage three had a massive impact on us all uh, with lots of things that we probably wouldn't have thought we could ever be banned from. Fishing, hunting, golf, Grampians National Park was closed. Um, we had food supply shortages. Uh, we had toilet paper supply shortages, which uh, you know many of us probably had a laugh about later on that that would never happen again. Borders were closed around states, of, um, yeah, which was not expected. Uh, international border closures and the good old homeschooling, which uh, provided a lot of extra work for parents, for school teachers and for everybody else around that. Um, th those restrictions when they were put in place helped us start flattening the curve. So things started looking a lot better. And by early May, uh, we had a fifth reason that we could uh, leave home for, which was visiting uh, family or friends. Uh, things still were looking okay. As we could return to school, playgrounds were reopened. And we, in late May, we were seeing a few smaller outbreaks, um, such as the Cedar Meats one, which I think uh, was probably the first one that got a lot of media attention. Then we had our first sort of big break in early June. More friends and family could visit. Finally, we were allowed to stay over uh, at different places for the night. And um, dining was okay, but only with limited numbers. Still no bars, but accommodation was open with restrictions and community centres and other things were, were similar. Our health organisations were locally producing planning for what was expected that we would have small local outbreaks, you know, uh, across the state and, and the country. Uh, we had the promise that if the community was doing really well and doing everything that it should do, which we knew we could do, that by the 22nd of June, we would see more easing of restrictions. By mid-June, and I know personally, um, there's a lot of chatter about, you know, complacency starting to set in in, in different communities. Um, and, and we were all enjoying being able to move around a little bit more. Uh, there were some more outbreaks in, in larger numbers. Um, unfortunately, the community wasn't all socially distancing well or taking all of the right precautions that they needed to. And that's not everybody I'm talking about. It's just, you know, as we get all the time, different groups, different individuals, and some people weren't even aware of what they were doing wrong because they, uh, you know, mightn't have heard things in the right langu languages, etc. Now, by uh, June 22, so not long ago, our, unfortunately, our easing of restrictions planning got changed. Our household numbers have been reduced again. Uh, further easing has been put on hold for now. And if we look a little bit broadly, more broadly across the world, the, the scenes changed as well. Uh, America approximately has about 2.4 million, as, or has had 2.4 million cases. Uh, there's been over 9 million in the world. Uh, our neighbor, close neighbour, Indonesia, is currently dealing with about 46,000 cases and they've had 2,500 people, unfortunately, pass away. Um, similar statistics in, you know, first world countries with leading healthcare systems. The UK's had over 40,000 uh, fatalities, Canada 8,000, Sweden 5,000. These are some of the best health systems in the world. So right now, for us, as we're seeing some larger outbreaks in our metropolitan area, and uh, I think that, you know, what we've termed as, as complacency has certainly been switched off for now. We're starting to see um, some similar things happen to what happened a while ago. Some panic buying in metro areas. Supermarkets have started reimposing limits as a precaution on staple food items. And there's uh, a, 
a uh, large theme out in our community about whether or not we're going to go back into that full lockdown again. Where are we he heading to? Well, I think it's, it's up to us largely as a community, and I'm talking across the state, not just specifically here, but um, we, we know we can all do the right things and we know we can flatten the curve. We've been able to do it before. Um, we've seen what other Australian states have been able to do. And I think right now in the Northern Territory, there's people having beers at the bar, which is, uh, seems uh, quite surreal, to be honest, to me. Um, now too. But, hey? You can have a beer and still now too. Limited numbers, but I think is, uh, am I right? Yeah. Um, but we can have an impact on what happens locally in and around our community. Um, how positive that impact can be is totally influenceable by us. Uh, I think the really important thing is that the mitigation strategies about keeping ourselves, our businesses, our staff and our families and our community safe are really simple. Um, it's just that we need to keep those up and we're hoping to discuss some of those tonight and probably look a little bit broader around that about risk and how we can create a really good community norm. So that's where we've got to, Dave. That's where we've got to. And I suppose the big thing, Greg, is that, you know, where we go in the future, we can have quite an influence on, really. And that's what we can do now. <laughs> and I've just been having a look at some of the pre, um, pre tonight questions and concerns that people had. A lot of it was where we've got to, but the next part is going to be really important about where we're going to. And in that, um, I think we've got to understand how COVID-19 actually spreads and the impact that it has to be able to then work out how we're going to deal with it and create strong vibrant businesses. Um, so I might ask Kate, from your health perspective and community as a community member, to give us a bit of a rundown on that, please. Yeah, thanks, Greg, and thanks, David, for bringing us up to where we are at the moment. So I guess for many of us, where there was a, a time where we had this wonderful sense of relief that, you know, we really got through this whole idea that there, we maybe we dodged the bullet and there wasn't going to be a pandemic for us. But we also came to terms with the fact or many of us did, and particularly the healthcare world did, that COVID hadn't gone anywhere. So we, we prepared ourselves for um, what it was going to look like if COVID started to spring up in different places. And we now know that that is what's happening. Um, so it's telling us that the transmission of COVID is very, very real. It really does happen. And it's more than likely that it's going to keep happening. So as David said, we need to really take control of the circumstance so we as a community continue to th thrive where a, you know, a tourism industry here is very strong um, and we need to be able to support our community and, and grow back into that. But I clearly have a vested interest in um, doing that in a healthy and safe manner so we don't see COVID outbreaks uh, directly here. So the bottom line is it's all about social distancing and hand hygiene and how we manage that in our community and in our businesses. So it, the issue with COVID is it is incredibly contagious and virile and it is basically transmitted in the moisture or from the moisture of our respiratory tract. So when we sneeze, when we cough, um, when we get chilly and breathe into our hands, it's all over our hands if we should have it. And then we touch things and that's how we transmit it. So being in close contact with somebody that's breathing um, the same air that you're breathing or being in contact with somebody that has it and coughs and sneezes and touches the table and then you go and touch the table. So the bottom line is hand hygiene and social distancing. So we are starting to see more and more hand sanitizer sneak into our um, businesses. We're seeing them at the door. 
Um, I tend to say a fairly easy thing to think about is set up sanitizer for every building that you go into. So before you walk into a building, whether it's your own home, whether it's a hospital, whether it's a school, whether it's a shop, you sanitize your hands, um, you sanitize on the way out, you sanitize when you get back into your car, and then that's a way of protecting yourself. Sounds like a lot, Kate. It is a lot, yes. And um, I believe the police now say that uh, the only alcohol we can carry in the car is 60% uh, proof for our hand sanitising. So... If you get caught with an open one, does it hurt or...? <laughs> <laughs> so I think when we look at different businesses and, and still install um, and surrounding areas, we are seeing different people doing different things. So some people have really brought in some very strict behaviours around what it looks like to walk into a business, hand sanitizer, how many people they can have in their areas. Um, and then others are less so. And I guess one of the experiences that I've just recently had is I had cause to travel to uh, another region of Victoria that has high tourism. And on every single door of every single shop was a standard poster that stated exactly how many people could be in that shop. And it respectfully said, you know, could you please support us and our community by um, honouring that we can only have four people in the shop. Uh, the butcher had uh, it also says that, you know, we request that if you can only have four people in, can you please leave? You know, if you're in shopping with somebody else, can they stay outside to support the business? And, you know, it was an amazing experience for me because over three days I was fully trained in how to be in their community. Um, I felt incredibly safe in their community, but they also trained me how to keep them safe and how to keep them in business. So I think you know, from a business point of view, we can really work together to standardise, I think David calls it our new normal, our new way of doing business so we can um, support everybody. I think it's the consistency yeah. that, that's important. If we can work out how to be reasonably consistent across the board, then it becomes easier for people to adapt to that and to have an expectation that everybody is going to be similar rather than I'm not going to go to that place because they're really strict or I am going to go to that place because they seem extra safe. So, Kate, can I ask, what type of things do I need to be doing? If I'm a business person up the stream or if I'm you know, running a, a restaurant or a hospitality industry, um, what sort of things should I be doing to protect myself, my staff and yeah, my customers from that. Yeah, so I think the first thing is obviously understand what your limits are. Don't bring too many people into your area. So it is about how you figure out your quotients. How do you figure out your, um, David, what is it? Your four by four? Four metre square quotient, yeah. Yeah, and you put up something that says to people, this is the limit. And, you know, as we drive around Victoria and all over the place now, we see people standing outside and honouring those types of directives. That's a very solid way of keeping you and your staff and our community safe. Hand sanitizers. Um, now there's other requirements around um, registering people. COVID Safe App is another strong uh, mechanism to help us manage outbreaks. Um, so encouraging people, and I encourage everybody online, to consider downloading and maintaining uh, the COVID Safe App. Because if we were to have a contact, it would very quickly enable us uh, to contact trace and minimise the spread within our own community should it happen here. So I know some of the places where I've been, yeah. you know, it's uh, they, they've limited the contact as much as possible to the point where you don't even have to open a door to go through. Correct. Or somebody comes to the door and opens it for you so they can manage the number of people and all those sorts of things. Yeah. So you know, benches and things like that, or sharing pens to sign stuff. Like, are there simple things like that that people can do to help limit Yeah, the it's risk? absolutely all about touch. Everything you're touching that somebody else is touching is going to be a risk. So many shops now are not taking cash. It's tap card only. Um, 
as you said, so many are in one door, out another to stop that um, transition. Um, the other things that we need to think about is also our shared work zones. So, you know, how many people can you have in your staff room or your kitchens or, you know, what's the safe zone there? How many people can sit in an office at any one time? Are they up on your doors so that your staff also know? So actually at Store Regional Health, there's not one room that doesn't have a quotient on it. So we all know how many people can go into each area. Or so, careers, yep. or the Oz Post bloke that might be delivering mail or, you know, I'm thinking there's outside people that might know the way we work. So, Correct. Yeah. Yeah. What if a staff member or someone comes into your business and you suspect they're unwell or how do you know if someone is unwell or not? How do you prevent that? Well, I, I don't think you can, I mean, it's certainly from an employer point of view, there should be standard screening for all your staff and policies in place so they understand um, that they shouldn't be at work if they're feeling unwell. And if you have staff that ring in and are feeling unwell, um, encouraging them to go and get medical um, advice as soon as possible. Um, this is an environment now where we really want to get on top of people um, that are potentially COVID positive. So anybody that um, is at home, um, there needs to be policies around how you keep them at home and how you support them. And I believe Greg's going to be talking a little bit about that later on. So I think setting up some of those policies and structures early so that you understand what your workplace looks like should one, two or four people need to stay away for any length of time. Thanks, Kate. Adrian, you've raised your hand to ask us something if you just want to unmute and, and join us. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've had a customer in the last couple of days who has been sneezing. Um, how do you politely ask them to actually leave your store? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question, Adrian. I actually was in a coffee shop on the weekend and I stepped off my cross and I was asked um, fairly rapidly um, that the requirement is that I stay on the, the cross and, and please don't get off the cross. And then I was yeah. asked to wait outside for my coffee. So I think, you know, it is about saying, look, um, excuse me, I noticed that... Um, you seem a little bit unwell or you're sneezing, would you mind stepping outside of the store? And, you know, if they're buying something that you need to take to them, you can take it out to them or, um, and look, it's not always going to be received well, but I yeah. think, you know, it's a lot about what David said before. If we're all consistent in what we're doing and saying, our community around us and even those that are visiting us um, become aware and familiar with what, our way of doing business is. And I know um, with one of the other, so I deal with a lot of different communities and municipalities across the region. And one initiative um, that a group have come up with there is having some printed material, really simple stuff, but just on what their expectations are about someone being in their store. So it covers those things like, if we think you're sick, we're going to ask you to leave, or if you're sneezing over places like that. So. The idea yep. of the few really simple dot points is that it's a consistent message coming from your staff as well. And if you've got some that are a little less confident in talking to people, or they might actually know the person as we commonly get in our communities, you've got the piece of paper that's already printed out to be handed to them. So it, it's not like a personal attack. It's just a, a standard practice for your store and it obviously hasn't been personally written for them. So it yep. takes the edge off things a bit uh, and allows it to be presented a little bit better. I would also be taking it on the tack that we're it's about us caring for the person as well. So it would be, oh, look, excuse me, I, I noticed that you're, you're sneezing. I'm just worried that you may be unwell in this, in this environment that we're living now. Have you thought about seeing your general practitioner or going up to the store regional health respiratory clinic and maybe having a test if you want some information on COVID-19 and hand them the sheet that way as well. So you're actually turning it to a care and concern thing rather than saying, look, we don't want you here. Mm. We've got yep. another question there. Thank you. Oh, no. Thank you. So um, 
And again, I think that is about building it into some of your workplace policies as well now, that if somebody presents unwell, that you actually um, require them to, to leave the workplace and go and, and see a GP. And as Greg said, we do still have the respiratory clinic going um, for our region, um, running out of store regional health. So um, at the moment, um, whilst we're not in blitz, uh, test turnaround is around 21 to 24 hours. Um, obviously, as the state demand goes up, times can be a little bit longer, but yep. um, at the moment, that's what we're looking at. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome. Um, don't forget, you can stick your hand up by the little reaction at the bottom, or if there's a question you want to ask us as we're going through the chat function as well, we're happy um, to take questions because we wanted to make sure that we get the information you get the information from us that you need. So thanks for that. Just one more point, I guess, about keeping community safe is I also encourage you all to think about who are the vulnerable people around you and have they set up their home appropriately? Are they in a home environment that um, is supportive of them? Um, I happen to know my mother's online, so she'll forgive me for telling this story, I hope. But, um, you know, I recently spoke to my mom and I said, you know, have you got your hand hygiene? And she said, oh, yes, it's sitting on the coffee table right here. And she was, you know, sanitising her hands a lot, which was great, but it's actually, she'd be at the front door for people that are entering into any of your elderly parents' homes or anything like that. You actually don't want them to come in with dirty hands. So um, think about, have you got everybody's um, home set up to protect them as you go in? And I know, Dave, you've got soap on a stump or something. That yeah, when I get out of the ute, I've got a, a uh, post there on the veggie fence, which I have my soap up on. So as soon as I get out of the ute, I can wash my hands before I go into the house. Um, yeah. That's yeah. only because he's too tight to buy sanitizer. <laughs> anyway, um, one of the, we, yeah, we've just been talking a little bit about the health of people, and so it's a really nice segue into mm. um, asking Jen Tumney, who works for Grampians Community Health, as one of our, or she's actually our program leader of our counselling program. And the reason we asked Jen to be able to speak with you tonight was, you know, I know I'm feeling it. I see it happening in our community and I see it in the staff that work for me that there's an awful lot of mental fatigue now that's happened after four months nearly of isolation and and as us Australians call it this shit um, so we there's that's happening the mental fatigue so I want Jen if I can to talk a bit about personal well-being looking after yourself but also assisting the people that work for you um, around that now Jen um, has lived, I think, since she was about 10 years old in the local community um, and has studied at, to become a counsellor and an expert in this area. Um, she started in home-based withdrawal around alcohol and drugs but has moved on you know, into family violence and also broader mental health counselling and generalist counselling. So, Jen, if you'd like to unmute yourself and um, welcome to tonight's webinar, I suppose we call it. Good evening, everyone. Um, yes, we've all heard of the, I guess, the physical um, components of COVID-19. Um, we've all felt some of the emotional effects of COVID-19 with um, having to isolate ourselves and working from home. And as we start returning to, um, I guess, some form of normality, um, one of the things that we may experience um, is mental fatigue. Um, and this occurs when we're under sort of, I guess, extended periods of stress. Um, um, and it can just make you feel physically, emotionally um, drained. Um, you may have trouble with um, your daily tasks and problems, and they may actually seem... Um, quite um, insurmountable and out of our control. Um, quite often something as, you know, minor, um, it just becomes huge and we don't know what to do. Um, so the symptoms of, of um, mental fatigue can actually be physical, emotional, um, and they can also be behavioural. Um, and 
humans being humans are going to vary from individual to individual. Um, just our, our personality traits, um, our upbringing and everything will um, have an impact on, on how, uh, how long we can go before we actually experience what is also colloquially known as burnout. Um, and the symptoms usually creep up on us. Um, humans are incredibly good at um, denying there is something wrong, I suppose you could say, um, until we finally fall in a heap. Um, so emotionally, um, individuals may experience um, symptoms such as depression and anxiety. Um, we may feel detached or hopeless. Um, we may get a sense of dread, uh, trouble remaining, um, maintaining focus and concentrating. Um, and we may actually experience quite a lack of motivation, um, which will result in a drop of our productivity. Um, physical symptoms may include headaches, nausea, chronic fatigue for no apparent reason, um, insomnia, um, tossing and turning of a night, worrying about what we're going to do. Um, with finances, how we're going to maintain our safety, our employees' safety, our customers' safety as we return to work. We may experience some weight loss or some weight gain um, due to changes in our appetite. Um, and we can even experience an increase um, of illnesses such as the common cold Um due to our uh, immune system being compromised due to our level of stress. stress. Some of the outer characters' behaviours um, that we may experience include poor performance. Um, we may actually even isolate ourselves further socially. Um, we may withdraw from activities um, and actually find it quite difficult to maintain our daily activities and we'll actually withdraw and find excuses as to why um, we cannot commit to our personal and professional commitments, um, such as we may call in sick more often to work. Um, and, and these can be really strong indicators that um, someone may be experiencing mental fatigue. Um, there are, however, treatments um, and options for coping with mental exhaustion. Of course, the best option is to um, remove the source of stress. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, that's not going to be an option at this stage. Um, but we can still request help or delegate some of our tasks and responsibilities to others both in our personal and professional lives. Um, we can tap into support. Um, you know, taking a break is an important part um, in managing uh, mental fatigue. A vacation, great option. Um, financially, for many of us, not a viable one at this stage. Um, due to the changes we have experienced with our employment, with our businesses, etc., um, It doesn't have to be that big. It may be just blocking out a couple of hours in your diary um, to do something special for yourself. Read the paper. Um, you know, actually sit out on the veranda and have lunch if you can find some sunshine. Um, you know, it, it can be even smaller than that. Um, it might be savouring the smell of a freshly brewed cup of coffee. Um, and that can actually give you just a 30 second break from the mental turmoil we're experiencing. Um, but it's always not possible to find the motivation and the time to do these things. Exercise, for example, is often the first thing that gets put to one side. And yet it has been scientifically proven to assist with both the physical and the mental health. Um, a recent study um, in 2010 actually reported um, participants reported an increase in their overall health and they actually felt better prepared to manage stressful situations and longer periods of stress. Um, relaxation is always a great one. If you've got time and the ability 
to participate in activities such as yoga, um, tai chi, um, deep breathing, massage, aromatherapy, progressive relaxation techniques, all being recognised as helpful to reduce stress. Um, and a lot of these we can actually do within our own homes. We don't have to go outside of our safe environments to participate in them. Um, getting enough sleep uh, is always necessary for our overall well-being. Um, and it's recommended that we at least try and get eight hours. Um, as I said earlier, insomnia with the stress we experience may impact that. And one of the ways that we can help achieve this is to actually develop a bedtime routine um, and stick to it. It might be having, um, you know, a warm cup of milk, good old wives tale with a, um, as you read a chapter of a novel, not something to do with work, not a report, not study, but something you're interested in, something that will help take you away from those daily activities that are causing stress. Um, it's not going to work the first time and it's probably not going to work the second time. But over time, we end up training our bodies and our minds that when we commence this routine, it's time to start winding down for rest. Um, eating a well-balanced diet, again, is also beneficial. Um, it, it helps us maintain our physical and emotional well-being. It helps us boost our immune systems. Um, and, and just helps keep us that, that little bit fitter and better able to um, function during the day. Um, like a car, you know, if you don't put the appropriate fuel in, it's not going to work properly. Um, and if all else fails, speak to your GP. Um, you know, a professional may actually be able to help you create some form of order um, in the chaos that we're experiencing in our heads. Um, you know, and it does not hurt um, to remember when you are feeling overwhelmed, um, you are feeling that you may be drowning and there's no end to this, um, that your employees, your families and your friends are also experiencing something similar. Um, and it's a good idea to actually ask them, are they okay? And how are they managing? Um, it may be that, you know, you, your family, your friends, um, or even some of your employees could um, benefit from some extra support. Um, and at Grampians Community Health, um, we can provide some of that support through the COVID Safe Community Support Service. Go now, go now. Um, oh, and, that was your moment. Um, and um, you know, if you feel do, if you feel you do need some additional support. Please contact Grampians Community Health on 53587400 and we will help you the best we can. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Jen. There was an enormous amount of information in that and I'm not sure that um, um, everyone would have been able to take everything in. So we are actually recording it and you know, Alison just asked the question, will we be able to see a replay of the event? I am hoping to post the event on Facebook yeah, well, it probably won't be tonight, but um, over the next few days I'll to get it up onto Facebook. But one of the th things I'd ask is, because there was so much information, um, is there any questions that people have got for Jen or anything that you'd like to briefly drill into? It's Andrew G. Uh, Andrew? You're on, mute, mate. You're on mute, Andrew, so you just have to unmute. Yep. I was just trying to do a, 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 a like to what Jen said. I hit the wrong button. You to Zoom. <laughs> right, yeah. That's all right. No, it was, it was incredible and so many important messages, but it's so hard, Jen, you know, we're all, um, we're all worn out, but we're all wanting to come out of this successfully. So it's hard to actually put yourself first. And so a lot of those things that you talked about, as a business person, would you be trying to really look for what the signs and symptoms you might be looking for in your staff so that you can direct them to do the things that you just spoke about? Does that make sense? What sort of things, if I'm running my business, what should I be looking at for the care of my staff? I don't think she heard me. No, I didn't actually, sorry. 
That's, that's okay. right. I, I know one of the I just one of the ones that I comment. So I've worked in a lot of incident control mm -hmm. centres and things like that when people have been under a, you know a lot of pressure. People are getting really fatigued. You know, not not dissimilar making different decision, decisions than we necessarily always need to do. And commonly a lot of those decisions are a lot bigger than ones that we do in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, little outbursts will come out at different times and you just think people are acting or taking things a bit differently to what they normally would. Yeah. Um, or sometimes it can be just people avoiding conversation a lot more than they normally would and they get a little bit recluse and that can be often a sign that, you know, pe people just need a bit of a break from things. Um, or getting short sometimes is another one I've noticed. Yeah. I uh, I'll recount a personal experience in, I was in 2011 with the floods and I was, I was working for the council at the time supporting the flood recovery in the Northern Grampian Shire. And it was hectic, it was hard work, and we did an awful amount, a lot of work. But about six months in, one of the blokes that was working with me, who I still class as a friend, pulled me aside and said, mate, you need to start looking after yourself. You need to have a break. You need to think about your family. You need to think about how you're going, because if you don't do something now, you're not gonna be any good to us. And I, th and I actually respected him for that. You know, because I went home and I and I thought about what he said, and I thought, "You're right. I am starting to to do all the things that Jen was talking about, um, and um, but not taking care of myself because I was too focused on the business that I was employed to do. And it was the best advice. I ended up shooting through for a week with my family, came back refreshed." and tackle the next 12 months head on. So don't think that people will actually disrespect you for saying to them, hey, I care for you. Yeah. Um, they will actually welcome it and grow from it. I know one of the ones I've had to do at, at home myself is just to talk about, I need a break from talking about COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily the easiest conversation because my wife likes to talk to another adult at the end of the day. And um, obviously the topic of conversation on everyone's lips is COVID-19, but I just had to say I need a break from it every now and then uh, because I just need to get that out of my head. So sometimes it's just as much as asking politely to just to get a bit of a break from things. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's I guess, remembering that we are all of this, in this together. Um, and sometimes it's about taking just taking a breath, reminding ourselves of that and actually asking the other person, you seem a little bit stressed, is everything okay? Yeah. Um, and that can be enough just to prompt a bit of a conversation and that's all some people need. And I think we are heading into a time of high anxiety. Yeah. I think as these clusters uh, perhaps get larger, We've got school holidays coming up. We're probably going to see more people come into our community, our shop owners, some of our businesses. Um, different people are going to experience those and have fear. And, you know, it is about, like you said, acknowledging that those anxieties are normal. Um, this is such a big unknown for us all. Um, I know um, as a fairly large employer in the region, I've done some work with um, Grampians Community to bring some professionals in to talk to my team, um, just letting them know that um, they're going to go through different things. Families are really struggling, so we got some family support in as well. So I think utilising the resources that we have in our community support to support yourself um, and your workers is a, is a great thing too. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Thank you very much, Jen. I might um, throw to Shane Arnett now. Um, Shane, welcome. As I said before, Shane works for Rural Financial Counselling Service as a small business counsellor. And you know, we traditionally think of Rural Financial Counselling Service as being for farmers and the agriculture industry, but their charter is very much all small businesses in rural Victoria. So 
Welcome, Shane. And you know, I really hope from um, your conversation that Jay will share with us tonight, it's a bit about you know, how we can plan for the future. I've actually seen um, some of the questions that are here in the chat from tonight or pre, and some of it was really about what happens post the on soon when the job keeper payments and all those things dry up, what happens around not being able to get supplies and all those things. So if you can sort of talk about that is part of um, what you've got to tell us, that'd be great too. Thanks, mate. No worries. Thanks, Greg. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, sorry, evening, everyone. Um, it's been a long day for me. Um, we just, I'll um, basically discuss some of the things that we're sort of seeing with clients that we see. We've had a lot of transactional clients um, since the whole COVID thing has, has started. Um, we have been extremely busy, although that has sort of dropped off uh, with all the release and the stimulus, uh, with some clients getting quite a quite a nice amount of, of uh, money out there to keep the business going. Um, one of the things that we're sort of talking through our clients with and that we're seeing is, is planning. Um, a lot of businesses do have uh, additional time to spend on the business instead of working in the business. So looking at things like how is the business going to operate once the stimulus ceases and putting that together and, and, and what marketing strategies you're going to use there um, as the, the restrictions continue to ease, uh, and we hope they do. Um, it will be sort of coming out of the, the stimulus time, which will be leading into Christmas. So hopefully, and traditionally, we've, we've seen the increase in trade with the spending. Uh, so it, it will depend on how much money is around. Um, there has been a lot of people being taking money out of super. Um, we've seen that with with uh, Bunnings and how busy that is uh, at the moment. It's absolutely going crazy. People are spending a lot of money on food. So we, we sort of hope that reflects back through into retail eventually. Um, another one is, is knowing your cash flow. Um, delving right into your numbers, knowing what it costs to open the doors in the morning to turn the key. Once you've got that down pat and you, you know you can try and reduce your costs as much as possible, review all your power costs, uh, gas, anything like that. If you have the time, look at everything, your suppliers. So when you're coming out of it, you can hopefully draw up a little bit of a budget, assuming the income that you, you may have coming in uh, look at your financials from last year and say, okay, where are we going to be positioned? A lot of businesses have done really, really well out of Corona. They've been able to get on the front foot and, and pivot the business and, and deliver new services and deliver them really, really well. Um, so there's a lot of work there that we've been doing with clients on the budgeting side of things. Um, and, and some clients just don't know what it costs for them to turn the key every morning. And it's good to educate there. Um, and there's plenty of issues. Uh, I just want to back up what Jen was saying. Look after yourself. Um, that's probably the utmost thing is, you know, if, if you're fit and healthy, then you're able to sort of keep, keep the wheels turning. Um, and uh, if anyone needs help in, in assistance, don't hesitate to give us a call on 1300 735 five seven eight or, or jump on the net and just google us rural financial counseling service wimmera sound southwest we're positioned right around the district warnable colac horsham hamilton and i'm in warnable we have got some new small business counselors starting soon so we do anticipate an increased trade once the stimulus sort of drops off a little bit so that that's about all all i've got greg so Shane, uh, I know you guys have been extremely helpful with people after other different types of emergencies. And from, if I've got it right, you know, people don't necessarily need to have to book in hours out of their time or anything else like that. And you guys uh, are able to um, visit sometimes or do different things like that. It's quite a flexible system, am I right there? Yeah, it's a really flexible system. 
um, we're able to suit clients' timetables and we can just work around their needs. Um, we just, we've been pulled a little bit back with the whole corona thing. Um, we, we do spend a lot of time on the road getting around and seeing clients. That's been pulled back and we've been conducting Zoom meetings and lots of phone calls. Um, and our, our network ability is probably our, one of our biggest strengths. Um, it's a free service, it's funded state and federally. So, you know, we're out there um, and we're helping people every day. Um, it's, it's a great job, I love it. But at the end of the day, it's being able to help someone uh, you know, sleep at night sometimes. And, and I'm thinking too, mate, uh, you're not, by ringing up and um, getting your assistance, you're not, you're not taking that service away from anyone who you might think needs it more. Like, you know, you, you, I'm guessing from conversations we've had before, it's if you need any help at all, just give us a ring and that's what we're here for. Yeah, ex exactly, David. You, you know, look, sometimes we may only sit down with, with someone for a couple of hours and have a bit of a cup of tea and we might be able to just get them back on track there. And, you know, um, sometimes it's a little bit more than that. But, um, you know, don't feel as though you're taking it away from someone else. If if you need to pick up the phone and, and have a bit of a chat and talk about some numbers, well, we're always here to help. So, um, Greg, would you be able to ask Shane where, how the service operates? So, Shane, where, where and how does Rural Financial Counselling Service operate? Okay, so our, our head office is in Hamilton and we've got other offices dotted around uh, our area. Uh, we we basically go to the sort of the fringes of, of Geelong. We we steer away from Geelong. Um, we've got an office down in Colac. Uh, we cover right through the Surf Coast and the Otway councils there, right back through Warrnambool and Glenelg, um, Golden Plains. Go through to Ararat, up into Horsham. We've got three guys up there. So basically, southwest of Victoria. Um, we cover that. We just have our main hotline and clients go through to there and then, and then counsellor will get, get back to a client. So it's a free service and we just jump in the car and if we need to go and see you, we can meet at your house or we can, we can meet at your business depending, depending on your setup at the end of the day. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a big weight off a client's shoulder when they know they don't have to pay for a service and you know, some of the expertise that our councillors have got, um, it goes a long way. Thanks. And one of the other questions was you just answered about home visits. So even though there is um, um, COVID-19 new restrictions, you'll still come out to people's homes and businesses if needed? We, we were, but just with the restrictions, uh, again, on Monday, we've been pulled back in to work from home. Um, so when those restrictions do ease, we'll, we'll be out on the road again. Um, we do practice social distancing, um, you know, the same as everyone else that applies, but just at the moment we've, we've been told to stay at home. Um, but yeah, as I said, Greg, once that sort of eases, we'll, we'll be back out there. Shane, I've just had a question from um, Lisa. He said, is anyone having trouble getting um, the cash boost money? Yeah, they're eligible for it, but there's nothing going in against the March Bass or the Pay As You Go yet. Are you seeing that with other businesses across the area, or is it something that you've got some tips? There has been, on? yeah, there has been a few out there. If they're not, you know, if they're not up to date with their books, um, some people are quite behind. So, with our clients, we got on the front foot early and really encouraged to to get in touch with the accountant and get that in order, especially that Victorian 10K grant that was out there. Um, it's, it's now gone. Um, some clients initially weren't eligible for the job keeper. So just monitoring the income there as well. So, um, with the clients that we've had, we've had to be right across the board and, and wary of, of dates, uh, so, of cutoffs. So am I hearing that it's unusual if everyone's 
if anyone's got everything right, the payments aren't going in. It's generally a, a glitch somewhere or something that's not quite right. Or is yeah, that, is that yeah. something people can come to you for help with or advice? But yeah, they can come and see us about that. Initially, I'd say speak with your accountant and make sure everything's in, in order there. Um, yeah. they're, the, they're the guys that have got to tick the boxes at the end of the day, you know, uh, log into the tax portals and, and yeah. make sure everything's in order. So we can help with that one, but to only a limited uh, extent. Yeah. So you would expect if someone was up or a business was up to date with their books, um, have staff on JobKeeper um, and putting all their BAS payments in, and pay as you go, that they would have had some some indication from the government or some financial return by now, or has there been some delays? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I would have thought that should have been th through now. So um, it's, a, it's a big follow-up, that one, as to where it's got to. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'd be straight on the phone to the accountant tomorrow morning. Okay. Straight away. Thank you. Has anyone else got any questions for... Shane? So, both Shane and Jen aren't going anywhere while we've got the video running, so if you do think of things you'd like to ask them, um, just jump on, wave your hand or type into the chat, and thanks for those that have. Um, okay, so... I, I will I'll say it because um, it's on the, the chat to everyone, so... Lisa's called the ATO every week. They escalated, said it would take 20 days, 20 days now up, and she's put in a complaint. Um, we know we're dealing with bureaucracies that are probably at the busiest time they've ever had in their life. I think it's not ideal by a long way if you're relying on the money. But, Shane, you just have to keep nagging. Is that right? And keep following the line? Yeah. Also, there's a hardship uh, phone number for the tax office. Sometimes that gets quicker results if you give those guys a call. Um, they have had a lot of new staff on. So uh, I think the more experienced staff members are on that hardship line, whereas the general hotline, uh, a lot of the new staff actually seem to struggle to know what to do. Uh, I've had better result, results on that hardship line. Thanks, Shane. Okay, um, where are we up to? We're getting close to um, the end. I suppose what I want to sort of set the scene a little bit about is what things you might need. So you know, what do you need to know around your workspace? Your, your, so, okay, um, we know we have to clean and we have to clean daily, but if someone was to come into your organisation that was symptomatic of COVID-19, Kate, that doesn't mean you actually have to do a deep clean that day. What would you do if someone came into the or into your workplace that had symptoms but not wasn't necessarily um, yeah, admitting that they've been in close contact with someone that had COVID nineteen or even down to Brim Bank at the moment? Yeah, um, I I think if somebody uh, well, obviously the hospital is a little bit different, but you know, if anybody work, walked into an environment that was clearly showing symptoms, then I would um, definitely be seeking to do an immediate clean, you know, yeah. asking them to leave and, and doing an immediate clean if there's been coughing and spluttering. Um, and this is when it becomes very important to make sure that you're managing your registers and logbooks and your contact app because. Um, if that person has come in and ends up being positive, then everybody thereafter. So I think it is important. I mean, it's interesting, a lot of people clean overnight, um, but actually during the day, it's important to have regular surface cleaning happening. Um, of those touch yeah. points, yeah. And there's some really good advice on the Business Victoria. It's not my, um, uh, you know, I can, I know what I have to do within the hospital, but there's certainly some great advice out there on Business Victoria website on how to maintain cleansing, what products you should be using uh, to support good cleansing. Safe Work Australia also have a yeah. really great site where you can put in the type of business that you have and it gives you, filters out a whole heap of different information. Yeah. One of the risks that I've just 
well, not just, but one of the risks that we've observed within our organisation is that you have to keep records now of people that come into your site. So if you're running a hospitality industry or you have people coming in here, if anyone's there for more than five minutes, you really need to be keeping a record of who's on your site, their phone number, and the ability to trace them if something was to happen. And we actually screen as well because we're a health service. But the risk with that is how do you then make sure that information is kept private and not disclosed? Because it would be off-putting for some people to come into our shops, our businesses, and have to leave their name and phone number for the next person to see. And um, we do have to keep that information for 28 days. Um, but how do we actually be a bit smart and inventive about not making that something that can be shared? There's probably alternatives to those. I'm thinking that are happy to have their name and phone number on a list and those that may want to kept privately somewhere which is out of reach or different systems of writing them down. So I know uh, one business that I talked to, they actually have a staff member capture that information. So people aren't doing it themselves, which does two things. One, you haven't got any uh, common surfaces that people are touching to you know, record their details. And the other is it's only the staff member that's getting that information. So as long as that staff member is a trusted staff member, um, it, you've got good control of your information and no one else seeing it. Because that would give me confidence going into somewhere to leave my contact details, which I think is what I was probably getting at, is we need to have our community coming into our businesses and being confident that their information is private. Um, there's so many people that scam you these days with phone numbers and contact tracing and all those sort of things. Um, but, um, you know, you have to have some confidence that the information's not going to be sold because the most important thing you can give away these days is your personal details. And, and the flip side also to that, Greg, is if there was a positive case and it was traced back to your business, you've got really good control and you have all the right information there rather than all of a sudden potentially you having to advertise more widely um, and, and socially asking people if they had visited your business. So, you, you know, you've got better control over managing that situation if you've controlled the information the whole way along. Yeah. So we've got another question from Adrian. Do you, do you want to um, talk to us, Adrian, or would you rather me read it out? I'm happy to do that. If you don't unmute in a second, um, I'll read it, but otherwise. So it's about having a retail clothing store and customers are required to record their name and contact and she understands that it's vital, um, but how do we enforce it? So again, when I was out um, in the regional Victoria, uh, many places um, have a single entry point. So people can't come in from different areas um, and there is somebody uh, watching that single entry point, whether they're actually taking the information or not. Um, they are actually monitoring it and just asking people quite politely, um, I'm sorry, would you mind stopping? It's a requirement that we record um, your name and uh, number if you're here for anything more than five minutes. So my understanding is if you're picking up a takeaway coffee or whatever, that's not a requirement, but if you're going to actually remain in the facility for any length of time. And, you know, again, I think it comes back to a lot of what we're talking about. If we're all doing that within the state and within our community, people just start to understand that that's the world we're living in at the moment. Um, just thinking about that question, I'm not sure if every store has to, I'm just trying to look it up to make sure I can answer properly, but I don't think all stores have to take that information. It was more about which ones to be potentially period, yes. do. And if you want to take the further step to be, you know, extra careful and extra safe, how may you approach mm. that, which you've yes. probably covered that second bit really yeah. well. And I think, unfortunately, the uptake of the COVID app has been good, but it hasn't been strong enough that we can contact trace everyone. So if everyone had the COVID safe app, 
we probably wouldn't need to be keeping details of who's been in our shops and everywhere else. But so that's why we will keep banging on about people getting that. But until we've got a, and I forget the number, it's a quite a high percentage of people that actually do have the COVID safe app. Um, we do have to be able to contact trace because we want to be seen as a community and business that actually cares about people to come into our shop. And that's what it is when you're actually taking their, their details. It's about caring for them if something was to happen, not accusing them of having COVID-19. Uh, I can tell you quite confidently that a lot of the contact tracing that's been going on so far has been done, the majority of it has been done outside of the app. So that's, you know, due to people keeping good records or having good recollections of where they've been. Thank you. Um, one of the things we quickly talked about too was screening before. So in health services, we're screening all the time. You wouldn't necessarily be screening every person that came into your bakery, into your clothing shop or your pub. Mm. Correct. No. So there's, there's not a requirement for that. Um, but it, again, I have seen on some of these signages, you know, these common signages that are on regional facilities, um, on shop fronts and that, they actually are a poster that says, and please refrain from entering if you have signs and symptoms. And that's exactly the screening we do at a healthcare facility. Um, you know, so it is actually a form of screening um, as they walk through the door, you know, please do not come in if you have signs and symptoms of a cold, if you, um, yeah. Which, which I think is really good risk management. Yeah. That's just from me personally, because, you know, it, even if they haven't got COVID-19 and they're full of the flu, you don't want all your staff coming down with the flu because then they're crook or they might have to go and get tested. If we go and get tested, we need to isolate until we get the results from our test. And, um, you know, if it does end up that there's something that ends up being passed around from your store or your business, then that can potentially mean that you might be shut down okay. for a, you know, considerable amount of time dependent on how well that contact tracing goes. So, you know, the, the better we manage things as far as mitigation and also with our record keeping, we're reducing that um, uh, risk of the longer time frames with able to being able to get back on our feet. And I think the other thing it does as well is reduce that risk of um, having larger outbreaks in our area and, and getting known for that. I'd be really interested if there are um, business owners out there, would you be interested in having something that was um, perhaps uniform across our community for those that wanted it, that was a sign that says, you know, in this region, you know, we, we welcome you, you know, um, please note that our shop is limited to, and you put a number in and it says, and we kindly request that, you know, respectfully respect, you know, request that you stay out. And, you know, it's somehow, is that something that business owners w would feel that there's a benefit for and, and support them in, I guess, having that common message and, you know, Adrian, maybe it answers some of your questions about how do you say this kind of stuff? You know, maybe if it's something that's coming from our whole community, it's a community voice that's actually saying it, you know, like, please respect our, our community. Um, we welcome you. We're COVID cautious, COVID careful, whatever we choose to say. We ask that, you know, you wait outside, we have a maximum of X amount in the shop, please don't come in if you've got signs and symptoms of a cold. You know, and that was something that, yeah, like I said, I saw in the recent days and, and I felt that it was a really nice way and, and taught me how to do the right thing. And I think it's actually a lot easier for us to, to do it now while we're at a, a period where things are a little bit of flux again. Mm. So we've got a bit of license to to really take a strong position. Yeah. Um, people are aware that things aren't perfect in the world anymore. I think there was a bit of a, uh, a fade off of people saying, hey, the restrictions are easing. We're on top of this, the curve's flattened. We've got social license now to actually work together to, to really promote this. And yeah. 
I know I'd be happy to, to be part of going forward um, having a shared message across our community. Yeah. It can also help build that support from local community that aren't attached to, you know, our businesses and organisations in feeling a bit safer that we're, you know, all doing the right thing and we're all in it together to keep everybody safe. Yeah. Um, That's a big yes up there. <laughs> so the, I'll just throw to the myth and I'd really like everyone, if you've got a myth that you'd like answered around coronavirus and businesses and that, but what's the biggest myth we hear all the time and it comes up nearly every day is that coronavirus isn't in our community, we don't need to worry. <laughs> Dave, you could probably answer that one. Oh, yeah, unfortunately I hear it from people that should know better. Uh, so when things were extremely locked down and no one was traveling around at all. We probably had a better idea that there was no COVID-19 in our areas because most of the, for most municipalities, uh, there weren't large numbers. I think there's only a few across the whole state that had a zero against having anyone there. But the thing, that people kept forgetting is the community transmission and that's where the virus is bubbling around where we don't know. And what we now have is a situation where with eased restrictions, we have people traveling around anywhere. And the virus, as Kate said to us already, can be spread really quickly. So without anyone knowing and anyone even seeing anything you know, because it, it, it's asymptomatic with a lot of people. We, we could have uh, numbers in our municipality right now that we're not aware of. Mm. And if those people are doing all the right things, then it mightn't spread anymore. Or if it doesn't get to the, you know, the most susceptible people, where it might not become, um, you know, in our face. So it, the risk, until we're all vaccinated or whatever else happens, it is always there and it can pop up and it can spread quickly and have large numbers anywhere in our state and anywhere in our country while it's still around. So, and I, I heard it from somebody that should have known a lot better today saying that exact same thing. It's not in our region, we don't need to worry about it. Um, I, I will, I, Thinking of a story actually that I got told not long ago about um, and it was somebody that works actually from this area and they were traveling to Melbourne quite frequently doing deliveries to one of the places that had uh, been affected. It was found out by COVID-19 and had a reasonably large outbreak. Now that person fortunately had been doing all the right things and you know if they hadn't they could have potentially brought it back here within, what, two and a half hours on the road, three hours on the road. And right now we've got, you know, quite high community transmission in uh, metro outer, outer eastern metropolitan areas. And it's only, you know, one family visit away. So we, we need to stay on our toes with this. Yeah. And I think, um, I think it's really important to note too, Dave, that, as a health service, we don't know if there are positive people in our community. Um, the only reason a health service would know would be that we were caring for them. So a COVID swab is as confidential as any other health information. Um, and the only reporting that is made public is a region. But that's actually the region they're registered in. So they may not be staying there. I mean, they might be registered as a resident of, I don't know, um, I don't know, pick a place, Adelaide, but they're living here in Stall or, you know, a Victorian place. Maybe they're registered in Geelong, but they've come up because they've got a boyfriend or a girlfriend here. So, you know, it is very important that we understand that it may well be here. We just don't know. Yeah. yeah. And the other side to that is, if it does come into our community, um, it won't matter because they won't be able to pin it down to Grampians Community Health or whatever business you're in. 
So how does that tracing go? How how forensic do they look, David? Do you know? Uh, probably getting a little bit more technical than I know specifically, but basically it involves um, a, a high level of investigation where they follow up every contact point that they can think of with all the individuals that were known as, as close contacts and have been in contact with the person that's got the virus. So uh, I think there's two things that go with it. So whilst there's been a lot of debate out in the state about the government not saying specifically, you know, who's got it or exactly where they come from, that can also give us a little bit of peace of mind that, you know, if we do have it, that we're not going to get all of a sudden people on our doorsteps saying, how dare you bring this into our community? So, you know, we've got some safety there around that. And there's, when you hear the Premier saying we've got thousands of people working on this, they literally are. And yeah. the number of active cases you say, you see as numbers are nowhere near the amount of people that they're keeping an eye on because they've come in contact with those people. It's quite substantial. And I think only, uh, you know, a, a day or so ago, the Premier said it was over a thousand people that were close contacts. So they're, they're keeping an eye on those people and there would be even more than that now. Does that help yep, answer? I think it does. Has anyone else got any questions that they're, you know, myths or things that you hear in the community that you think are true or untrue, I'm happy is that, to... It's Rosalind worse trying, than the flu. I sorry, will say, okay. is Rosalind trying to say something or is it... So, Rosalind, I, would, yeah. I would like to make the comment that we do not have a local newspaper and it has previously been the most effective way of communicating. Glossy leaflets and pamphlets are not always read. Mm. In my own particular age group, the ignorance and lack of straightforward, consistent messaging is quite poor. So, Rosalind, do you think we have... I won't call you Rosalind, Rosie. Do you think we need to um, look a little bit different about how we engage with our older people within our community? I or does do it go back? Yeah. Today I got a letter from um, a senior's card and it was the first comprehensive advice that I have actually read. That <laughs> It is so confusing for ordinary people as to how to enter a store, how to buy something, how to get out. Where do you wash, well, where do you sanitise your hands? Some of us are on restricted movement because we're vulnerable. But there is just no or has not been a consistent way mm. of communicating thus far. Ros, would you be happy to share that letter with us? Not uh, right now, but with me? Yes, certainly. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. And Lisa just made the comment that hopefully from the 3rd of July, we may have a Stall Times news back in our news agents and shops again. So that would be good again oh, too. Excellent. Yeah. So we're getting towards the end of the, the workshop. It's 25 past seven. Um, is there anything that we haven't covered that people would like us to cover? Um, is there anything that they hoped we did that we didn't? Yeah, that you hoped we did we didn't, you're parking it till now. And if there's not, is there anything from Dave or Kate that you would like to add? I suppose a big one is um, we make sure that we supply the details where people can contact us later. I know from a lot of um, things that I've been to previously, people often like a, you know, one-to-one -one conversation with people, so I think we've got some details on that event, right? Did we? Yeah. Um, or there's Grampians Community Health that people can contact. Yeah, so Grampians Community Health, we had our home isolation support service, and that was really about supporting people who 
were directed to isolate. But then we extended that to being, you know, people like um, Roz and other people who are vulnerable in our community that have been advised, hey, perhaps you shouldn't be going out, you should be looking after yourself. We were actually providing that support to people who chose to isolate as well rather than those that had to. But what we've done now is actually look at it and say, hey, you know, perhaps um, anyone as a community, this is really a health promotion, this is a preventative thing. So we've actually got a COVID safe program now, which incorporates our home isolation support service. And you'll see it at Shop 108 in the Main Street of Stall that there is information available to people and things like tonight are part of that program about being able to engage with our community um, to keep everyone um, informed about what's going on. So there are a couple of chats that have just come through, so I will. Um, any of you to pop into my store? Well, I would like any of you to pop into my store and go over anything we are doing. Would love to, Adrian, I'm sure one of us could pop in and have a look and that is something that we talked about. Yep, and if it's a closed shop, perhaps I might go in there. <laughs> <laughs> if it's closed, I'll be there. No. no. Um, absolutely, Adrian, we're more than happy to do that. If you just want to get in contact with us, we'll do that. Yeah, but at the same time, Northern Grampian Shire Council, with their, mm. their business and economic unit, I know they're out there doing an awful lot in the community, and they've got the details, and they're part of this meeting tonight as well. Mm. Um, so we will follow up because... We're interested to follow up. Yep. I'm sure the um, Northern Grampian Child Council will follow up because that's their core business that they're invested in. As far as uh, referrals or a no wrong door type thing, Greg, mm. I, I'm guessing that if any of you guys got rung up and asked who can we go to for something, you'd be happy to make sure that they get put on to the right person. So often it's hard to remember things from... Um, you know, webinars yeah. and other different things. So if they just rang the Grampians Community Health, you'd be able to refer them on, would you? Or Yeah, yeah, yeah we would. Um, we all work, and I think that's one of the strengths of the community, particularly uh, that we're trying to foster, is that we actually all work together and we all understand each other a lot better. So if it's not us or Kate or Northern Grampians, we will find the support if you come to us. Yeah. Uh, there's a question there from Mason. What is the possible time for social support groups to resume? Uh, it's important for mental health and it definitely is. So groups can actually start again now, I believe, in small numbers. And um, we are, I oh know, Grampians Community Health, we're looking at that. So there are restrictions on space and um, how many people can be. And so... For things like travel, that makes it difficult where people have to travel together because you've got to be able to maintain that density in cars and then you've also got to be able to clean and all those sort of things to make sure things are right. But it really comes back to the space and if you've got the space to be able to do it, I think it's... Is it up to 20 people yet? No. Maybe, I think it is. No, I'd have to check. Um, but there is no reason. It's really about capacity of businesses getting back operational again as to why groups can't happen and a lot of that is because some of the carers and people involved are still isolating and looking after themselves as well. Um, the question still is too for workers where you can work from home you should so. Yeah. Um, that... Certainly for the chronic health ones so for the pulmonary clinics and that come together um, socially and medically um, because they are a vulnerable group um, they're not coming back at the hospital yet, but yeah. I'll, I'll give, if you want, I'll just read through some of the common things that we got just to make sure we've covered off on everything. So uh, some of the questions that before we started were around greatest challenges, managing stock, customer hygiene, operating under restrictions, understanding guidelines. Um, and my comment on that is they're ever-changing and hard to keep up with, even for myself, mm -hmm. um, from whose department they um, come out through. And, you know, it, please feel free to ring up any of us if you want to chat through that stuff because I think a lot of the times it's just talking through something rather than um, necessarily trying to interpret it yourself. Keeping customers and staff safe. Challenges moving forward, 
For me personally, I think the big challenge for all of us will be the longevity of this and needing to manage those sort of three things that we've talked about today, the physical stuff, the mental stuff and the financial stuff over a long period of time. You know, we, you know, might be at this level all the time, but I think it's going to be around and we're going to be managing things for many months yet. So any planning you can do in that medium term, and this is what I'm saying the same to the different organisations I speak to, it is a good way of thinking. And um, Shane may have something else to say about that. Consideration for outside travellers from the city. Um, there's been lots of questions around that. I think we've covered a, a few different things there. Managing staffing levels, the reduced income, and consistent hygiene practices by all businesses. So that jogs anyone's memory uh, about something we may not have covered off well. Mm. I'm sure we're happy to answer any more questions or we can individually. Yep. I've got a final message if I can. A final message from Kate. Sorry. We're sort of right on 7.30, yep. so we've stuck to our guns. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll say thank you and yeah. really appreciate yeah, sticking with us through this. There's mm. still 26 people in the, yeah. or 23 people in the chat. So we've only had seven people drop off probably to get their tea. Um, so really appreciated everyone being part of it. Re really appreciated the help of Northern Grampian Shire of Rural Financial Counselling Services, of my team at Grampians Community Health, of Kate and her crew, and Nicolene at Store Regional Health. Dave for his contribution. So thank you for being mm. part of it, um, and it's yeah you know, it's been great. Some of the interaction we've learned out of this as well, and I'll hand over to Kate for a final message. Well, I think that gazump me, but um, really just wanted to reiterate what David says. We are in for the long haul. We're all here to support um, you all, as um, Greg just said. Don't be shy to be COVID cautious. Speak up if somebody's getting too close or whatever. Don't be shy. Let's look out for each other. And the only other thing I would say is during these times, it is a long haul, please make sure you keep doing all your regular health checks um, because, you know, life is still happening to us. So just um, if you've got specialist appointments and that, please continue to do all your screening and everything. That's it for me. Thank you, Kate. Nice way. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, everyone. Thank